You go to a monastery where you're, the, the program you're in, you're going to practice lots of silence. Different things go to your, through your mind, at least they did through mine. And I've been there before, and, and I actually like lots of silence. And, but, but I was also tempted, and I wanted to be honest with you, um, because I thought, man, lots of silence. And at night, the hardest time I thought would be at night, you get back to your room, it's at 9 o'clock. I'm used to going to bed at 11. And I thought, okay, two hours or an hour and a half to two hours, I'm just going to slip in my briefcase, three movies and earphones, because we had no Wi-Fi connection in our room, no Netflix. And so I'm just going to slip in three movies just in case I decide to watch a movie, you know, in the quiet of my own little room in there. And I picked out, Caitlin has quite a movie assortment, and so I picked out uh, The Imitation Game, uh, it's, a, I think, an excellent performance by Benedict uh, Cumberbatch, uh, who plays, uh, oh, Tuner, Tun Tuning, I think, Alan Tuning. Uh, true story uh, where he and his group of sort of misfits, chess player, strategist, intelligentsia, they are able to crack the, the uh, supposedly unbreakable codes and the Enigma machine of the Germans during World War II. And it's got some controversy in it, but it's such a uh, well acted one. So I took that one. And then one of my favorite older movies is Robin Hood with Kevin Costner. And I love the guy who plays Fire Tuck. And one of my favorite scenes is at the very end of the movie when Robin Hood is going to marry Maid Marian. And, and Fire Tuck, you know, he's, he's a real rough guy. And he says, If anyone has cause why these two should not marry, let him speak now or forever hold your peace. And there's this pause, and then burst into silence is King Richard, played by none other than Sean Connery, who says, I speak. And everyone gasps because it's King Richard. And King Richard comes in, he says, I will not go on with this way. And I'm like, shh, I can do it the right way. And then he walks up to the to main area, a little country. I love that part for some reason. And then, and then I don't want to watch that. I don't want to. And then Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which also has Sean Connery playing Harrison Ford's dad. And Sean Connery calls Harrison Ford Jr. all through the movie. And so it's one of the climactic parts at the end of this movie. You know the, the movie, The Search for the Holy Grail. And so Indiana, it's just, it's just a couple of inches away from his grasp to, to, to the chalice that Christ drank from. But there's this earthquake, and he's almost to reach it. And he's holding on to his dad's hands. But in order to get the chalice, he has to let loose of his dad's hand. And it looks like he's going to fall to his death because all he can focus on is this chalice. And then Sean Connery says, Indiana, let it go. And Indiana lets it go, and he's brought to safety. And I thought, I wonder how many times God is whispering to us those things that are pulling us away from Jesus. And he whispers to our heart, let it go. Let it go. Well, the truth be known, I thought about watching them, and I never did. Do you know why? There was something so sacred about the experience I had that week, I could never bring myself to watch the movies. I would think about it, and then I would think, no. And it wasn't a legalism. I could have done it. No one would have known. And it wouldn't have been a big deal. It wouldn't have been sinful. I don't think. <laughs> but it was somehow tainting the sacredness of the formation. I was experiencing. I just didn't want it. Before we get into the scripture today, which is Romans 8, 28 and 29, which Claire so wonderfully helped me introduce Romans 8, 28 today, I want to give you a quote. One of my favorite authors is Dallas Wilbert. And I want to share with you something I'm thinking about. And, uh, and I want to qualify that, but he says this, the most important thing in life is not what you do, it's who you become. That's what you will take into eternity, who you become. Here's what I've been thinking about. And I want to name this up front. This is speculation. This is, you know how Paul would say, this is not the Lord, this is my thought on the matter. You know how he would qualify that? From qualifying it. I'm not going to give you chapter and verse of, of how this is so. It's, it's the way I'm thinking as a result of Scripture interacting with it, but I still want to call it speculation. <laughs> I'm thinking more and more that there is a continuity, a connectedness, a continuance, if you will, 
When we cross from this realm as Christians into the next realm, call it heaven, the realm of God, the kingdom, that, that where we have developed and to the degree God's grace has, has developed our spiritual lives is where we cross into, into the next realm. Again, it's just a thought process I've been thinking about. I base it on some scripture, but I'm not willing to call it a doctrine. Jesus said in John 14, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, many dwelling places. Paul talks about the rewards given to Christians, and he compared them to the glory of the cosmos, how there are different levels and, and emphases of glory in the cosmos, Comparing that to our rewards, Jesus talked about the parable of the talents and how those who are faithful over this, over this one, will be put over ten cities. Faithful over five will be put over five cities. So it implies a difference in, in, in our placement somehow. And I personally think we'll continue to grow. Remember Jesus, it says of him that he grew in wisdom. Statue of God, right? What do you believe Jesus ever said? I don't. And yet he grew in wisdom. So he wasn't static. He wasn't static in his growth. It was something that continued. I think even though we will be free from sin, we will continue to grow in that realm. And so I think Dallas is on to something. Dallas Willard, the most important thing in your life is not what you do. It's who you become. That's what you will take into eternity how you have been formed at this point. Which gives us great incentive, if that be true, to not merely see Jesus as one who saves us from our sins and gives us a ticket, if you will, to make it to heaven. This kind of a walk is more than just getting to heaven. It's really about allowing heaven to get into us. It's about letting heaven manifest itself in us through spiritual formation. So, as we, as we think about that, I want us to, to look at these two verses this morning. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 28, and then we'll look at verse 29. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know, would you read this verse with me, and then we'll go back and sort of break it down. But let's read it all together. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. We know. It's a word, uh, the Greek word means to experience and then gain perspective or insight. So it is knowledge by experience. It is, it is learning something because of the experience, and it is making changes because of that. So it is experience that leads to, to insight in our lives. When we were kids, we had in Milton, uh, you know, town that did not have a lot of wealth, but we had lots of good village connections with our family, and the kids during the summer, we would take off, and, and mom never knew where we were, at least not any every day, but one of the mothers did, and they always knew we'd be back at supper time, and someone in the village knew where we were, and, and he didn't have expensive toys, he just made stuff up, he just did stuff. And uh, this was one of the things, the older, not older brothers, and there were older kids in the neighborhood, and then there were some of the younger ones. And I still remember this. It's the craziest thing, but they would have the water hose out, and the younger kids, of which I was one of them, we were in our swim trunks, running around in our yard, and the older boys, it sounds terribly cruel, the older boys had wet towels. And they would snap us as we walked by, well, as we ran by. Well, I don't, I don't want any part of this. And, and this seemed to me, you know, as the Spanish language would call it, a stupido. But anyway, <laughs> there was this one older kid, he was about three years older than I was, and uh, he had guts. And he would just do that, and they would snap him, and pow, it would hit, and everyone would laugh. The older kids, of course, would laugh, and he would laugh, and he'd just keep doing it, and they would just pow, snap him as he ran by. At the time, he's three years older, I had such admiration. I thought, man, this guy has guts. As I got older, I began to think, that guy was a stupid guy. <laughs> 
I mean, you know the definition of insanity, right? When you do the same thing over and over, expecting different results. That's not what the word know here means. The word know here means you experience and you learn from that, and consequently you change. You don't stay the same. You change your behavior. You perceive things differently. You gain insight. So, and we know through experience and insight that God causes everything to work together for the good. God causes everything to work together. Another translation says God causes all things to work together for good. What does that mean? I, I, I wrestle with that this week. What does it mean he causes, you think everything means everything? All things mean all things? Uh, I, and then I thought about the context. I mean, think about, think with me when this was written. This book was written, this letter, and it's really his, uh, his greatest theological treatise, his magnum opus, uh, it's the book of Romans for the Apostle Paul. It was written in about A.D. 55, 56, somewhere in there. Before that, a decade or so before that, the Jews, Christians and Jews, had been chased out of, out of Rome by the Edict of Claudius. But then Nero came into power, and they were brought back to Rome. But there were some tensions, and by A.D. 64, the great fire of Rome is going to find Christians becoming the brunt of the accusation and great persecution would rise because of that. So this is sort of in that window in between where there is tension, but it's not fully manifested yet in all out unbridled persecution. So when he says that we know that God causes everything from his backdrop, his backstory in writing this would be the, the constant battle he's had with Judaizers Jews who have become Christians who are still demanding that Gentiles live by Jews. And he constantly is running into that, and no different in Rome. Because in Rome, there's tension between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians over that issue. And there's also in the horizon this looming tension and portent of the storm of persecution that is just always one act away from an emperor. That is the backdrop um, that's most closely associated with his words, and we know that God causes everything, persecution, everything else. We can expand it in our day pretty easily that God causes our hurts, our pains, our rejections. God causes our failed relationships. God causes our battle with our illnesses, with our financial God causes our times when we are in danger or when we are angry or agitated or angst. But God also causes our victories, our blessings. Everything, all things, God uses it 24-7 to work together for the good. So every moment of, of every day, whatever is happening in our lives, God uses that and causes it to work together for our good. Now, the word work together. It's one Greek word. We translate it into English words, but it's one Greek word. And it's the word from which we get our English word synergy. Synergy. Isn't that interesting? So God takes these things and in a, a synergetic way causes them to multiply for the good in our lives. In synergy is that idea that the effect of, the, of those together, right? it could be a church staff, it could be a school staff, it could be companies working together, but the overall effect is greater than the sum of individual parts. So it means one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, it equals ten. There is a synergy that multiplies the effort. That's the word Paul uses when he says that God causes everything in our lives to, through the hand of, of his serendipitous synergy, to work together to those who love God and call according to his purpose. The word good is the one I spent a lot of time on this week. Good. Well, what's that mean, though? Everything can work together for the good. And here's the question I have. Good, but as defined by whom? Good, but 
Who's defining good? Am I defining good? If I'm defining good, I may be, there may be a drought. Maybe maybe we're in a drought. And I've been planning a golf outing for a long time. And on the very day of the golf outing, thunderstorms are looming, right, on the horizon. And I know we're in a drought, but I pray, Lord, I pray that it doesn't rain today so that I can play golf. And it doesn't rain, and I call that a good thing because I got to play golf, even though all the farmers are starving, and eventually will starve because of that. Is that a good thing? It's kind of a selfish thing, isn't it? So if you leave it to me to define the good, we probably have problems. So I think it's, it's good, but it's defined by God, not by me. Not by you. It's good as God defines good. Um, we had some of Ray and Marion's cousins with us uh, this, this weekend. And an older couple, and they have, uh, is a grandson who went to the Marines? Their grandson uh, just got his wings. He's a pilot now in the Marines. And he has gone through quite the training process. They even trained him to be, in case he was a POW. So he was in this little cubicle, and all kinds of stuff that we would call pretty bad stuff happening to him in training, in preparation, because He's defending our country. Now, at the moment that that's happening, when he's in that little cubicle and he's being treated like an enemy as a POW, it didn't feel good to him. But it wasn't because it was training him for something later. When you're in basketball and your coach has you running those 10 last wind sprints, you're already gassed, and yet 10 more wind sprints, and you're just, you're just really mean. And it doesn't feel good to you. But the coach knows that if you're in better shape than the opponent, then you're going to do better in the game. So it's a good thing, even though it doesn't feel like a good thing. If you're a dancer and the choreography has to be meticulous, and you go over it and over it, it seems like a hundred times, and the coach is just so picky, it doesn't seem like a good thing. It's a good thing. Because when the performance night comes, it becomes normal and natural for you to go through the rhythm and emotions of that poetic artistry. Our cousin, Lorraine's cousins who are with us, she's had some really severe health problems, and we were talking about this, and she said, in going through these, it was hard. But she said, it's so built my character. And I understood that. Some of the things I've gone through in my life, and maybe you can say this also about things you've gone through, see if this sounds familiar. I've often said, I would not want to go through that again for anything. But I would not trade what God did for me in the midst of it for anything. God causes everything through serendipitous synergy to work together for good to those who love God call, love God. It's the, it's the Greek equivalent. The noun is agape. Agape, agapao is the verb. And that's the verb that's used for, for those, to good to those who love God. The idea is that we unconditionally are committed to God in this process called the journey of our faith. And we're committed to God even when we don't feel like it's good, even when we don't understand even when, like Jesus cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, in the next moment, says into your hands, I commit my spirit love for God. That's the love it's talking about. For those who love God and are called, it means summoned by invitation, called according to his purpose. So it's really important that we understand God's purpose in this, which is verse 29 of the next line. It says this. For whom God foreknew, God also predestined. I just want you to say that word, predestined. Let's get it out of our system. Can we say that? Predestined. predestined. I know it doesn't roll off the tongue for Methodists and Wesleyans. So predestined. Next week, I'm actually going to talk about that, but not this week, sorry. Anyway, we're going to deal with the second part of this verse this week, and then do the first part of this verse, and verse 30, I think, next week. For whom God foreknew, God also predestined or predetermined to be conformed. Here's where I want to start. To be conformed, because this is the purpose of God. 
To be conformed to the image of His Son. To be shaped into, to be spirit formed into the image of His Son. That's the purpose of God. So that everything that happens, all of these things, everything, all things that happen, and God's working together for good, the good is His very purpose, which is to form us into the image of His Son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is a friend and teacher. But have you ever thought, Jesus is my brother? He's my brother. And when we are born from above, the DNA of the Holy Spirit, God's DNA, the Christ DNA, spiritually speaking, comes into us. And we begin to, as we are formed by Him, and as everything works together for good, we begin to live out what it means to be in Christ Jesus, which is how this chapter starts. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation, no condemning sentence, for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus is our new residence. That's where we live. And it's in Christ Jesus that now we become brothers and sisters of Christ. His DNA is in us. And we are living out the reality of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's who we are. That's who we are. So find the enemy. Find the enemy of your soul. If I'm the dark one, I'm going to do anything I can possibly do to deter you from that purpose. To distract you from that purpose. To cause so many busy good things to get in the way that you will never have time for the best things. That's what I'll do. And if you want to read a really good Read, though the syntax is a bit dated, read C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. As it becomes the strategy of the master demon explaining to his young cohort, here's how to stump the Christians. To keep them from growing into this brotherhood and sisterhood of Jesus. Being in. Father, we thank you, Father, Creator, for the work of your Spirit that is forming us into your image. And we ask you and invite you, sir, to continue that work and help us to see the things that need surrendered, the things in our lives that need challenged, the crust that grows over our hearts that needs broken up, the paradigm shifts that so desperately need shaken in us to live out what this means to live in Christ Jesus in the kingdom realm as brothers and sisters of Christ. Thank you for the synergy of grace. In your name we pray. Amen.